G'day Wraiths and Sprites. I just wanted to try something different for today's video. I'm reading these from a book and they're the um, best <laughs> the best Australian yarns by Jim Haynes. It's just a section in there that's Aussie myths and mysteries. It's more just like an explanatory sort of thing. I, I was hoping to find something, um, something like a personal story of someone encountering a bunyip or something, but that didn't happen. In the first story, yes, it is a punishment to be shipped to Australia back in those days. Um, today, if you were shipped to Australia as a punishment, you'd think of that as like a reward. Australia is a great place. Ah, I'm babbling again. Anyway, so thank you very much for watching. And that is all for today. I'm going to go look up some stories now, some really good true stories for you. Um, and I'm hopefully not going to repeat any of that other channels have been doing at the moment. I'm going to try and make mine unique. So, yeah, I'll see you then. Thank you very much for watching and subscribe because things do go bump in the night. The Legend of Fisher's Ghost. Four months after the mysterious disappearance of a local farmer, Fred Fisher, in 1826, a respected and honest settler, John Farley, arrived at the local hotel in a state of shock. In one version of the story, it is said that John claimed he had seen the ghost of Fred Fisher sitting on the rail of a bridge over a creek. The ghost pointed to a paddock down the creek and then faded away. The body of Fred Fisher was later discovered in the paddock where the ghost had pointed. The other version says that Farley reported seeing a ghostly figure sitting on a bridge railing. Investigations showed blood on the bridge at the point where Farley saw the spectre and a tracker was brought in and said he smelled white man fat under the bridge. The body was found in a deep hole in the creek near the bridge. Frederick George James Fisher was born in London in 1792. He was a shopkeeper and, either innocently or deliberately, obtained forged banknotes through his business. In 1815, Fred was sentenced to 14 years transportation to Australia. In 1822, he applied for a ticket of leave and secured a property at Campbellton. In 1825, Fred had an argument with a local carpenter and received a light prison sentence. Worried about his farm, Fred gave his neighbour, George Worrell, power of attorney during his sentence but after his release in June 1826, Fred disappeared and George Worrell announced that he'd sailed for England. Three weeks later, George sold Fred's house and belongings. In September 1826, George Worrell was arrested on the suspicion of Fred's murder. During the trial, stories of the ghost emerged and George confessed. Even though the tale of the ghostly sighting could not be told in court, as stories of the supernatural were not permitted in the court of law, Worrell was hanged at the rocks. Seven Sisters this is a traditional Dreamtime tale and composed by Jenkin Thomas. In the Dreamtime, many ages ago, the cluster of stars, which we now know as the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters, were seven beautiful ice maidens. Their parents were a great rugged mountain whose dark head was, was hidden in the clouds and an ice-cold stream that flowed from the snow-clad hills. The Seven Sisters wandered across the land with their long hair flying behind them like storm clouds before the breeze. Their cheeks were flushed with the kiss of the sun and in their eyes was hidden the soft, grey light of the dawn. So entrancing was their beauty, that all the men loved them, but the maiden's affections were as cold as the stream which gave them birth, and they never turned aside in their wanderings to gladden the hearts of men. One day, a man named Warrena, by a cunning device, captured two of the maidens, and forced them to live with him, while the five sisters travelled to their home in the sky. When Warren R discovered that the sisters whom he had captured were ice maidens, whose beautiful tresses were like the icicles that dropped from the trees in the winter time, he was disappointed. So he took them to a campfire and endeavoured to melt the cold crystals from their beautiful limbs. But as the ice melted, the water quenched the fire, and he succeeded only in dimming their icy brightness. The two sisters were very lonely and sad in their captivity, and longed for their home in the clear blue sky. When the shadow of night was over the land, they could see their five sisters beckoning to them as they twinkled afar off. One day, Warren I told them to gather pine bark in the forest. After a short journey, they came to a great pine tree and commenced to strip the bark from it. As they did so, the pine tree, which belonged to the same totem as the maidens, extended itself to the sky. The maidens took advantage of this friendly act and climbed to the home of their sisters, but they never regained their original brightness, and that is the reason why there are five bright stars and two dim ones in the group of the Pleiades. The seven sisters have not forgotten the earth folk. When the snow falls softly, they lose their wonderful tresses to the caress of the breeze to remind us of their journey across the land. 
When the seven sisters were on earth, all the men who loved them, the Bere Bere, or two brothers, were the most faithful. When they hunted in the forest, or waited in the tall reeds for wild ducks, they always brought choicest morsels of the chase as an offering to the sisters. When the maidens wandered far across the mountains, the Bere Bere followed them, but their love was not favoured. When the maidens set out on their long journey to the sky, the Bere Bere were grieved and said, Long have we loved you and followed you in your footsteps. I remains of the dawn, and, when you have left us, we will hunt no more. And they laid aside their weapons, and mourned for the maidens until the dark shadow of death fell upon them. When they died, the spirits pitied them, and placed them in the sky, where they could hear the sisters singing. Thus were they happily rewarded for the constancy. On a starry night, you will see them listening to the song of the seven sisters, to remember them as the faithful lovers who have listened to the song of the stars from the birth of time. Bunyips Bunyips are creatures that lurk in swamps, creeks, waterholes and riverbeds, emerging at night, often with terrifying cries and blood-curdling screams, devouring any animal or human venturing near their home. It is said that women are their favourite prey, most likely because they are more defenceless. Descriptions of the bunyip vary greatly, from a gorilla-type animal to a half-human, half-animal. It is similar to a fish, with scales. Some reports say that the bunyip has fur or feathers, a long neck and tail, or even claws and horns. Scientists suggest it may be a diprotodon, which became extinct about 20,000 years ago. The existence of bunyips was taken very seriously by the white settlers in colonial times. Out in the bushland at night, hearing strange, loud noises, they were sure that the bunyip was out there, waiting to attack them. In Geelong, in 1845, the unfossilized knee joint of an enormous animal was found. A local aborigine identified it as a bunyip bone and drew a picture of the bunyip. Around that time, a woman claimed that her mother was killed by a bunyip at Barwon Lakes, just a few miles from Geelong. There are reports of other women being killed at the Barwon River with a barge cross to South Geelong. Many Australians now do not believe in the bunyip and disregard it as being purely mythological. There are some, though, who still believe the creature exists. Certainly one of the troopers at the siege of Glen Rowan believed in the monster. When Ned Kelly emerged from the mist dressed in armour and an overcoat, complete with his famous steel helmet, the reporters present later wrote that someone shouted, It's a ghost. The troopers opened fire and the bullets bounced off Ned, and the senior constable Kelly reportedly cried out, Look out boys, it's a bunyip. He's bulletproof.